Greetings, everyone. Uh, before we begin, we want to remind you that we will be answering your questions after the broadcast. Please submit your questions to us via social media. If you take any photos of your class during today's live stream, please feel free to post those photos and hashtag SnowDesk2020. And welcome, students, to this edition of SnowDesk, the show from the snow in Grand Teton National Park. <laughs> I'm Ranger Olivia and I'm Ranger Elizabeth and we are coming to you live from the town of Moose in Grand Teton National Park which is located in the northwest corner of the state of Wyoming so you can see Elizabeth and I are located at that little red star there and go ahead and find yourself on that map and think about how long of a drive that might be. Ooh, I bet for some of our viewers today it's many days drive mm -hmm. and it's pretty wintry out here today. You've actually connected with us as we sit at a desk made out of four feet of snow. <laughs> um, today we've got pretty sunny skies. Uh, it's about 10 degrees out um, and the views are beautiful. This winter here in Grand Teton we have had a lot of snow. This year we basically just had to carve this desk out of a pile of snow and shape it into our snow desk. In fact, this January was the snowiest on record, coming in at 169 inches of snow in just one month, wow. with more in February. So um, it's a lot of snow, and I'm wondering what the weather is like to some of our classrooms today. Yeah, I know we have some students tuning in from Jacksonville, Florida. Ooh, it must be so warm there. Yeah, I bet you they are seeing quite a contrast yeah. in terms of weather now. So this park is one of many special places in the United States that have been set aside to be protected forever. And these special places like the Statue of Liberty, the Golden Gate Bridge, and Harriet Tubman National Historic Park, Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, Yosemite National Park, Everglades National Park, Zion National Park. Wow. These places have all been set aside because they tell the story of all Americans and are important to people around the world. And there are lots of amazing things to explore and discover and learn in these places because they have been set aside to be protected for you. And that means that these beautiful places will always be here for you to come and visit. But until then, we are super glad that you get to visit Grand Teton National Park today by tuning into our broadcast. Yeah. And Grand Teton National Park was created to protect the beautiful mountains, the pristine waterways, and variety of wildlife. This place is incredibly wild in part because of our extreme seasons. For example, we are coming to you live in the middle of an incredibly long winter. I wonder if anyone out there can guess how long you think our winters last here in Grand Teton. Yeah, well, if you guess about six months, you are spot on. We see our winter lasting anywhere from six to eight months. It's about half of the year. That's a really long winter. Mm -hmm. And during these winters, we get a lot of snow. The average amount of snowfall here in the mountains is about 400 inches or 30 feet. That's about the height of a three-story building. So I'm wondering, classes out there, how tall your school is in comparison to the three stories of snow that we get. That's a lot. Um, but it's not snowing here all the time. Our snow does melt. And in the summertime, um, our snow runs into our lakes and rivers and in today's broadcast of snow desk we are going to be exploring the role of water here in green teton and back home where you are yeah and water can exist in three different ways or states of matter solid liquid and gaseous and we actually have some fun hand motions to go along with each of these three states so if you can follow along in your classrooms or at home so we have solid or frozen water and then we have liquid or flowing water and then we have gaseous which is like steam yeah. All around us at Snow Desk, we see solid water in the form of snow. Frozen water can come in many forms, though. We see it in snow, ice, glaciers, ice caps, permafrost, 
and so on. And we have a field correspondent standing by who would like to tell you about a unique form of water that is frozen here in Grand Teton National Park. Ranger Ann, can you hear us out there? Hi there, my name is Ann and I'm a park ranger here at Grand Teton National Park. This weekend, I got to ski down my favorite form of frozen water, a glacier. This is one of 11 glaciers we find in the park today. A glacier is a large moving body of ice and snow that takes years and years to form. The weight of the snow and ice creates a lot of pressure and squeezes that ice and snow and makes it move downhill. That's different from regular snow and ice that you might encounter. Glaciers actually flow like a large river of ice. Imagine Silly Putty. Silly Putty is solid but if you put it on top of a desk, you might see it ooze over the side because gravity is going to pull it down, just like a glacier. Glaciers are really big. They can be at least as big as your school, if not huge. Glaciers are a really important form of solid water because they can shape mountains, melt into cold, clean water, and serve as habitat for animals. One creature that needs glaciers to survive is the western glacier stonefly. Stoneflies are small insects that live in clear cold water and lay their eggs in mountain streams. So imagine like water that is recently melted from a glacier. In fact, Grand Teton National Park just discovered a new species of stonefly in a stream formed by the melting water from the Middle Teton Glacier. And that stream is icy all year long. We know that stoneflies are very sensitive to water pollution, so having them here is special. Stoneflies tell us that we live in a healthy ecosystem. Furthermore, stoneflies are an important part of the food chain, and they provide sustenance for animals such as our beautiful rosy finch, and they eat the insects that we find in these cold, snowy habitats. So imagine if we didn't have glaciers, we wouldn't have these cold mountain streams, and we wouldn't have stoneflies, and they wouldn't serve as food for our beautiful rosy finches. So glaciers are a really important part of frozen water that we find here in Grand Teton National Park. They are my favorite form of wa frozen water, and I hope they're becoming your favorite too. So please think about, you know, a form of frozen water that you might find in where you live. And think about it for a minute and then turn to your neighbor and share what you thought of. So, welcome from Grand Teton National Park. I will see you guys later. Goodbye. Thanks, Ranger Ann. So go ahead and take just a second to think about the question that Ranger Ann posed. She was wondering what is one solid form of water where you live? So go ahead and think about that and turn to a neighbor and share. Yeah, lakes and rivers. Yeah. So next, liquid water is the most prominent form of water on Earth. And this is, of course, what we drink with and cook with and wash with. Mm. And liquid water can come in the form of dew or rain or even rivers. And we actually have a field correspondent standing by who is broadcasting live from the Snake River here in Grand Teton. Ranger Clay, can you hear us? Hi there, my name is Clay Hanna and I'm one of the rangers here in Grand Teton National Park. And I'm really excited to share with you one of my favorite forms of liquid water here in Grand Teton, and that's the rivers. Now I'm coming to you live from the Snake River, one of the largest rivers in the Western United States. Now we're fortunate here in Grand Teton that the headwaters or the start of the Snake River is just to our north. And that river flows through Grand Teton, through Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and eventually all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And that's pretty amazing to think about that this water here eventually makes its way all the way to the Pacific Ocean. You know, I've always thought how long that might take. I wonder who I should ask. Maybe I'll just ask the river. River, how long does it take you to get to the Pacific Ocean? Wow, well said, well said. 
Now, surprisingly, the river does not always look like this. When do you think the river flows the fastest? What time of year? Now, if you said the spring or the summer, you're absolutely correct. Because during that period, all of this frozen water, this snow that we see, is going to start to melt. And as that turns from frozen water to liquid water, it's going to have to flow somewhere. And eventually it makes its way down to the Snake River. But in the winter, this time of the year, the, it can actually get cold enough at night that the river can completely freeze over, which is pretty amazing. Now, no matter what the river looks like, what the water looks like, whether it's frozen or liquid, creatures here in Grand Teton National Park, they depend on the Snake River in order to survive. Creatures like bald eagles, cutthroat trout, moose, beaver, and one of my favorite animals found here in the park, the river otters. Now, river otters are a member of the weasel family, and they've often been described as adorable, playful, and just all around fun. Now, river otters are carnivores, and they'll spend most of their time in and around the water, but they can also be found on the banks of the Snake River. They usually travel in family groups, and they can be seen wrestling on the banks or in the water. And even this time of the year, when there's snow on the banks, they'll make slides that go down into the Snake River, which is really fun. Now, river otters are very sensitive to pollution, which is important for us here in Grand Teton because that allows us to measure the health of the river and the ecosystem. Now, I want you to imagine this pristine river behind me. Imagine if the Snake River were polluted and how that would change the game. Well, it might mean that we don't have river otters, which could change the food web and completely change the ecosystem. So that's just one example of how rivers are an important source of liquid water. Now I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about where you live and all the different sources of liquid water that can be found there. And in just a moment, I'm gonna have you turn to a neighbor and just describe to that neighbor what your favorite form of liquid water is. But before we do that, I'm gonna send it back to the snow desk. Thanks, Ranger Clay. Can you believe he tried to interview a river? <laughs> All right, classes, go ahead and take a moment to think about Ranger Clay's question. Uh, what is one form of liquid water near where you live? Next, we're gonna talk about gaseous water. That's water that's all around us. Maybe you've been outside on a cold day and you've seen your breath. Ooh, Can't ooh, see it today. I can kind of see it. A little bit. This is gaseous water or water vapor. And we can find water vapor when water heats up. And here in Grand Teton, we have a special example of naturally warm water where field ranger Megan is standing by. Megan, can you hear us? Hi, I'm Ranger Megan. I'm coming to you from Kelly Warm Spring here in Grand Teton National Park. And my favorite form of water is steam or water in the form of gas because it's sneaky and you never know where you're going to find it. In fact, sometimes it's invisible. You can see it a little bit here today. If it looks a little foggy behind me, that's because I'm standing next to a warm spring. It's about 80 degrees year round, so a little, little cooler than your average hot tub. And there's a pocket of magma underneath us that's keeping that steam, that water warm and pushing it out into the warm spring for us. Now there are other animals in the ecosystem that'll take advantage of the steam here. Bison need to bulldoze through that snow with their big head, like a snow plow, to get down to the grasses, the sedges, the forbs. They're herbivores, so they need that stuff. Now if they were over at snow desk, they'd be digging through snow chest high on me. But I just measured the snow over there, and here at Kelly Warm Springs it's only about six inches of snow. So a lot less work for them to get to that lunch. And they're 2,000 pound animals. They need a lot of lunch. So when you come out here, you might find bison wandering around and taking advantage of the warm steam in this area. They're an important part of our ecosystem. Without them, our food chain wouldn't be complete here. So we're really happy about that. They're also really important because this is one of the only places in the world that you can find free roaming bison. Now, that's just one reason why I like steam and water vapor. I want you to think about your home for a second and think about all the places that you might find steam and water vapor. 
you might have to imagine for a second because it's probably invisible. Once you've thought of it, I want you to turn to your neighbor and share your favorite form of water vapor back home. Snow desk, back to you. Thanks, Ranger Megan. So go ahead and think about some examples of gaseous water where you live, which might be a little bit more challenging than the other two forms. So go ahead and get creative. Um, some things I can think of that I encounter on a daily basis are maybe steam from a hot shower or maybe from a tea kettle. So we've learned that water exists in three different ways. We've got frozen and liquid and gaseous. And it actually travels in three ways through the water cycle. So while many people in Grand Teton come as a vacation destination, water in Grand Teton goes on a trip even more spectacular than most of our visitors get to go on. It travels through the water cycle. Would you all like to come along? <laughs> Or the straps of your guitar Water moves about the Tetons you eat It's simple, can't you see? The water cycle, one, two, three Follow along to the tune of this song One, evaporation when this song comes out Two, water condenses in the clouds Precipitation when the clouds get mighty heavy and the rain it all falls down. Then down our cascades and then we get up waterways, brings the rain to our rivers and our streams. Glacial lakes are filled in the way that water will make us jump with joy. Such a catchy song. Oh, it is hard it. not to dance along. So you might be wondering, if water travels by way of evaporation, condensation, and precipitation, where in the world, not just Grand mm. Teton, can we find all this water at any given moment? Especially right now, with all this talk of water, I am getting very thirsty. Ooh. Okay. Let's think about all the places you can find natural, fresh water. Okay. Oh, like Jackson Lake. Yes, but I'm not thinking for specific names like Jackson Lake. I'm looking for categories like lake. Okay. Lakes only contain 0.013% of the world's <sighs> water. Wow. So let's th see if we can think of all the other places you might find naturally occurring fresh water. Hmm. Well, I just read in a book that there's actually water underneath the ground mm. in aquifers. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge storage of our fresh water on Earth. We find 1.69% of our water there. Okay, and I also just learned from that fun song that water evaporates Ooh. and condenses into clouds. Mm -hmm. Yes, and clouds actually hold 0.001% of our fresh water. Oh. So I know there's also water in our soil. Totally, yeah. Um, we find the same amount as clouds, 0.001%. Okay, and oh yeah, rivers, like the Snake yeah, River. Yeah, like we saw with Ranger Clay. Yeah. Yeah, we see 0.0002% of our water in lakes and, I'm sorry, rivers and streams. Hmm. I have also had someone tell me that human bodies are made up of 70% water, so there must be some water bound up in plants and animals. You nailed it, Ranger Olivia. Yeah, we find a very small amount, but still significant, coming in at 0.0001% wow. of our fresh water. That's very tiny. 
Um, what about like the glaciers and snow all around us? That's all made up of water. Totally. Yeah, there is a lot of fresh water found in the frozen snow, glaciers, and ice all around us. We have 1.76% of all of our fresh water on Earth is saved in frozen water. Ranger Elizabeth, I'm, I'm doing the numbers over here. I'm doing the math. That adds up to less than 4%. Yeah, you're right. The bad news is that the rest of it is in salty ocean oh. water. Oceans contains 96.5% of the water on Earth. So that's not really a lot of fresh water accessible for us to drink. Yeah, and this is really important because Earth will never get more water. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is all the water that we get. And even though it moves and transforms and goes through the water cycle, we are never going to get more. And in fact, did you know that the water that we drink today is the same water? water that dinosaurs drink. Say what? You've got to be kidding me. I know. It's crazy. So if there's not really that much accessible fresh water, what should we do with our water? Hmm. Well, we better take care of it, save it, keep it clean, try not to waste it, mm -hmm. and think about how we can save water. Hmm. And the good news is there are a lot of ways. And we've got one example for all of you, um, but I will warn you that this video is a little silly. Um, so, but we get we get the good message yeah. out of it. So, here we go. <laughs> I warned you that that video was a little goofy. I will tell you our rangers don't actually sleep in the visitor center. Mm -mm. Um, but we did learn that the ranger who left their faucet on wasted three gallons of water. And that means every day that ranger wastes six gallons of water. Wait, why six? Because hopefully you're brushing your teeth twice a day. Here's the question. How many gallons of water could your class save every day 
if everyone turned off their faucet while brushing their teeth? Work through it on your own or in groups, and we'll discuss the answer in just a second. So let's say you have 30 people in your class. You can actually multiply 30 people by six gallons of water, and you can figure out that you can actually save 180 gallons of water per day, which is like a couple of bathtubs worth of water. And over the course of a week, we are talking over a thousand gallons of water. And in a year, a class of 30 could save 65,700 gallons of water, which is like a big swimming pool's worth. Whoa, that is a lot of water. Wow. So I'm wondering, what if each of us went home and taught this to our families? I bet you we could save even more than a giant swimming pool's worth of water that way. Okay, so I know that some of you already turn off the water when you brush your teeth. So go ahead and brainstorm some ways that you can save water in your everyday life. And I think that you should take that idea home and discuss it with your family. Mm -hmm. But some of our students out there are thinking they could take shorter showers. Yeah. They could wash the dishes more effectively, turning the water off in between. Yeah. Mm. Maybe not watering the lawn as much. Ooh, that's a really Ooh. good one. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we have talked a lot about Grand Teton and how much water we can have depending on the snowpack. Uh, but there are many places that are much drier and hotter naturally, like Death Valley National Park in California. It's mm. the hottest and driest desert in the United States. But there are some places that are receiving more water than they're used to, like the flooding in Mississippi and Tennessee. And there are other places that aren't receiving as much water as they're actually used to. Uh, this is a good example of the fires in Australia. So think about your hometown and what you've been experiencing. Are things wetter or drier? And what mm. have you noticed? Yeah. So go ahead and find out what is happening in your region, because if your area is getting drier, it will be super important to save water. And if your hometown is getting wetter, it will still be important to save water so it can move through the water cycle to other drier areas. Mm -hmm. And it'll also be super important to keep that water clean. And you can probably think of places around the United States and the whole world where people don't have access to clean drinking water. So go ahead and encourage your friends and neighbors to take care of their water. Teach one person one way to save water and tell them to teach another person and go ahead and pass it on so that we have enough water for everyone. Yeah. Wow. That sounds like a big job ahead. So. Let's recap. The world only has one supply of water, and that a, a water exists in three different ways. We find it frozen, we find it in a liquid form, and we find it in a gas form. And water moves through these states as it travels through the water cycle. And those stages are condensation, sorry, uh, evaporation, evaporation. <laughs> condensation, and precipitation. Yes, and the water that we have in Grand Teton National Park might end up as your drinking water someday, or the water that you have in your hometown might end up here in Grand Teton National Park as glaciers or rivers or even steam. So we have to take care of the water to take care of the wildlife. And protecting the water, the wildlife, and the park is a pretty big job for us park rangers. And sometimes our hard work is not enough. We need help. And we think it's up to the owners of national parks to help us protect them. So friends back home, I'm wondering if you can point to someone who you think owns national parks. So friends at home, I want you to go ahead and stick out your thumb. Go ahead and point it right back at yourself. You are pointing at someone who owns a national park. And if you point to your neighbor, or your teacher, or your other friend across the classroom, you are pointing at someone who owns a national park, because everyone owns national parks. 
And the funny thing about it, too, is that national parks even belong to future generations. So if one day you decide to have children, they will own national parks and your grandkids and your great grandkids and your great great grandkids. They belong to everyone and it is up to all of us to protect them. Wow, we challenge you and your teacher to talk more about how you can protect national parks near you. National park sites like Sleeping Bear Dunes, Yosemite, Everglades, Isle Royale. There are over 400 park units you can see on this map. There are so many. So go take a field trip, learn, explore, become a junior ranger and find your park. Because in the words of the Lorax, unless, unless someone, someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Snow Desk, the show from the snow here in Grand Teton National Park. Uh, I believe we've got a few questions coming through social media. So classes, if you're thinking of things, feel free to submit them to us and we'll try to answer them. We also have our tech rangers behind the scenes. Um, maybe we can get a glimpse of them so we can give them our appreciation for making this <laughs> live broadcast happen today. Um, and they'll be telling us some of the questions and we'll be happy to answer them. Mm -hmm. So bring them, bring them to us. There's our tech <laughs> There's rangers our tech over rangers. there. So our first question is, how long does it take for all the snow to melt? It's a good question because we have a lot of snow around us, about four feet down in the valley. And like Elizabeth was saying, we can get about 30 feet up in the mountain range behind us. And it kind of depends on the year because like we said, winter lasts a really long time here, anywhere from six to eight months. And as a matter of fact, I have seen it snow here in June. Wow. Yeah. June, yeah. in my opinion, should be summertime. Well, it should not, not be always. snowing in June, but that is not always the case. So it kind of depends um, on the year, mm -hmm. but up in the mountains, sometimes there's still snow banks and big piles of snow well into the summertime, yeah. sometimes even June or July, sometimes even August. And we know we just learned that there is some snow in the park that actually never melts like yes. on glaciers like glaciers yeah awesome and i think we've got some photos of the summer here in grand teton so you do see it is green uh and brown here and we do have beautiful wildflowers that come out uh so snow does melt but you will see it year round up high in the mountains mm -hmm. Oh, so our question is, they're, they're wondering if there is liquid water mm -hmm. up in the mountains in Grand Teton National Park. Mm -hmm. And that question makes a lot of sense to me because you can't really see any rivers or streams up there. You just see frozen water. Right. But um, as all of that snow melts out, it actually all funnels into these high alpine streams and it comes down and feeds the Snake River. Mm -hmm. So during the spring and summer months, you can actually see these really beautiful cold melt off so <laughs> melt water <laughs> streams yeah. way high up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Here's some photos of some of those streams that are coming down from the mountains. And when folks are hiking or backpacking in the summertime, they'll bring water purification with them in the form of a filter or different types of drops so they can treat their water while they're out there mm -hmm. and have clean drinking water. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, our favorite aquatic animal. Wow. Hmm. What's your favorite aquatic animal, Ranger Elizabeth? Well, man, I, that's a tough one because there's a lot of really amazing ones, but I think kind of like Ranger Clay, uh, he talked about the river otter and mm. I think that might be one of my favorites. 
because um, they are quite amazing animals and how they stay warm in the winter time. They have this incredible fur that has multiple layers to it. Yeah. Helps them shed water so they can stay warm on the inside and they have extra insulation so they can swim in the cold water. And I think that would be an amazing superpower to be able to swim in the water in the winter time. <laughs> what? Uh, I also think it's awesome how they play. They're incredibly playful creatures, uh, and they always look like they're having a good time when I see them. Yeah, I've seen them sliding on their stomachs so or on the snow by the banks wow. of the river, mm -hmm. and it is pretty fun. Yeah. Hmm. So I think that my favorite aquatic animal here in Grand Teton is probably the beaver Ooh. because I think it's pretty amazing that they are able to completely change the whole habitat regime True. for a really large area by building dams and yeah. ponds. Um, and they're actually creating a lot of habitat for a lot of invertebrates and birds right. and s um, other creatures that might be super happy living in a pond. Yeah, and those teeth. Yeah. Oh, they've got the coolest teeth. Yeah, and one really cool thing about their teeth is every single time they bite into something, they are actually sharpening their teeth mm -hmm. because their teeth actually have a big plate of kind of yellow iron. Yeah. So the front of their tooth is much harder than the back of their tooth. So every time they bite, they're actually filing their teeth by shaving off a little bit of softer tooth so cool. in the back. Wow. Amazing. So cool. What is the best way for people to conserve water? Mm. Well, I think there's a lot of really good ways that you can save water every single day. And we talked about a few, like taking shorter showers, being more efficient with washing dishes, mm -hmm. turning the sink off when you brush your teeth. Mm -hmm. That is a really important one. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I think I get a little sad when I see people just letting their garden hoses spill out all mm -hmm. this water onto people's lawns. Yep. Even during the summertime, it's I, I think that that can be pretty wasteful yeah. if you're just leaving your garden hose on all day for your lawn. Yeah, I agree. Ooh, we've got somebody out there whose dream it is to become a park ranger. They're looking for some advice. Uh, I would say to c stay curious about the world around you. Um, go visit national parks and talk to rangers uh, at parks near you and see what their journey was to get there. Mm -hmm. um, I would say there are lots of different types of rangers out there. So any job that you want to do in the national park, uh, there's probably a place for you here. We have folks that help with traffic control and working with wildlife um, and managing people. We have folks who do education, um, folks who teach people how to use bear spray. We have rangers that are dedicated to maintaining our roadways, working on our construction projects. Um, we have rangers that patrol the rivers and the mountains. We have firefighters. We have police officers. We have medical services. So anything that you're interested in, uh, there's most likely a place for you here. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would say just keep following your passions and your interests. Um, and hopefully that will lead you here. Oh, that's a really good question. So someone is wondering how the water here in Grand Teton National Park might become polluted. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting question because we spend a lot of time trying to protect the water here, but it has happened in some national parks, definitely. And um, um, one thing that comes to mind is just the amount of people that come here and swim in our lakes, our alpine lakes. I'm thinking maybe they could spill something bad into the water, like maybe using a lot of bug spray or sunscreen mm -hmm. and then 
immediately going swimming. And on that note, a lot of people also bring their watercrafts here. So all types of stand up paddle boards and rowboats and floaties and canoes. And uh, we actually spend a lot of time checking those vessels for invasive species that are not supposed to be in our lakes mm -hmm. because they can really, really damage the habitat in all of these lakes and rivers. Yep. Ah, good one. Okay, <laughs> the question is, do we check the trails and how if we do? Um, and I would say the answer is yes. We have rangers who are wilderness rangers or backcountry rangers, and their job is to go out hiking around the trails, check out how they're doing, and report back different conditions. So we do that by foot. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have different crews that head out into the backcountry. So we have trail tr crews, um, and those are the folks that help maintain our trails. Uh, they'll do different maintenance projects to them. So they'll be out on trail all summer long, uh, exploring and working on the trails, reporting back and letting us know how things are. And then we also have visitors that go hiking, um, and they can come back and tell us at the visitor centers or if they see a ranger around, if, mm -hmm. if they see any trail conditions that are noteworthy or if things are clear from snow or have lots of snow or are really muddy, they can come back and tell us about that. So we use a lot of different resources to help check the trails and know what's going on out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have two more questions. Uh, first one is, how cold is it? And it's 16 degrees right now. Um, for us, we're like, oh, it's pretty <laughs> warm out. Um, we've been sitting out at snow desk last week. Uh, we actually had to do snow desk inside because it was negative 23 degrees out mm -hmm. here. So it's too cold for us to be outside safely. Um, but today we're doing pretty well. <laughs> and yeah. then the last question was, do we have amphibians here? Yeah. Yeah. So amphibians, that is a really good mm -hmm. question. So we actually do have a couple species of amphibians here in Grand Teton National Park, but they're actually a little bit hard to come by because mm. of our super, super harsh winters. So it gets so cold and we get so much snow that a lot of our smaller waterways completely freeze over. It's even possible for the Snake River to freeze yeah. over. And that's pretty amazing considering how, how wide it can get in some places. So because of that, the f amphibians tend to have a really hard time during the winter. So they might prefer to live somewhere where the water doesn't freeze quite as often. Awesome. Well, thank you all for your questions and thank you for